So if um, you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter, and we're going to uh, complete the passage we sort of started last week. Um, we are in chapter 3, and we, are, uh, we started with verse 14, but there were several things I wanted to say about the very beginning of verse 14. So that sort of got us going, but I'm going to carry right on and get through to verse 17 tonight. So what I'd like to do is read the passage first, and then we'll uh, make a few comments. So verse 14, chapter 1 Peter 3, 14. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put, will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you would suffer, excuse me, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. All right, so we're going to work our way through here. But last week, we concluded with this. The, the possibility of persecution is real, though not a constant worry. The way it's presented here, it's presented as something that could happen, not something that will happen. It should not be uh, our expectation. And if it comes, it won't be consist, uh, constant. It's not like, you know, there's a uh, situation where a persecution arises and then that is your lot in life. There's a target on you every day for the rest of your life. That's not the way it has happened historically. And that's uh, not, uh, and so that is, uh, there's a bit of an assurance in that, the way it's stated in this verse. The other thing is that, uh, and uh, uh is there is it is presented as as a, a blessing it says if this should happen to you even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness you are blessed and so we talked about what that meant and so the consequences of all this we should we ought not to take the possibility of uh, persecution into consideration in preparing ourselves for the way we should live we should be trying to live according to the precepts of God's word, regardless of what uh, any pot potential situation that might arise in the future. We should orient ourselves around faith in Christ and living for him, not in fear for self and in avoiding trouble. And I think that, uh, you know, we, there is a certain measure in which we, you know, we can talk when we're in a group like this, and we can uh, we can make bold statements about uh, how uh, uh, you know we will act out in the world. But when you're out in the world and you're talking to people who aren't Christians and they react in a negative way, I find I'm not quite so bold. Probably you find the same thing. So we need to really focus on living for the Lord and really putting him in the right place in our lives in order that we can deal with not just persecution, but just simply the peer pressure of people who aren't believers. And uh, you know they're not, and they might even express it to you, and they might sort of make fun of you. Uh, I wouldn't call that persecution. That's just the way things are. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, uh, all of that is true. That was sort of from last week. But if persecution should come, how should we act in response? And that is the burden of this passage overall uh, and our topic for today. So uh, I want to read a quote here from Hebert. Uh, he says, To consider oneself blessed while suffering persecution is not natural. And that's true. And so Peter offered practical guidance. The Christian response has both negative and positive demands. Negatively, Christians should not yield to the natural reactions of fear and agitation. Positively, they should keep Christ central in their lives and make appropriate responses to their adversaries. So I want you to see that structure that he's talking about. So if you'll take your Bible again and look at the passage. So there's this possibility is raised. Even if you should suffer, right? So then he says, you are blessed. And then we see this. Do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. So that's, that's the negative. He calls out 
the negative demand. So, so we're not to yield to the natural fear response. That's the first one. And then the next one is in verse 15. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. But that's the next uh, demand, as Hebert is calling it. And then the third one is in verse 16. And keep a good conscience. So we're going to come through each, th each of those three demands and talk about what they mean. And then there's a little bit more for good measure in verse 17. All right, so turning away from fear. And uh, there's, I give you a little literal rendering here in the notes. The fear of them, do not fear, neither be agitated. All right, so that's how the words go in the Greek order. In our translation, it says, and do not fear their intimidation. And uh, there is, uh, so the fear of them could be intimidation. Or it could be, uh, it could be the kind of fear that they have as well. All right. So there's a little bit of ambiguity in the language, but that's that's what um, that's the way the translators took it. And we're going to look at where this comes from in the Old Testament. This is a quote from Isaiah eight. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute as well. Now the verb here for, for agitated means to shake up or agitate, like water in a glass that has been sharply jarred. It conveys the picture of agitation and confusion. So in John 5, 4, the verb is used to uh, talk about the troubling of the waters at the pool in Bethesda. So that the, uh, uh, when the, the lame man, he, there was this legend that if they were to get into the waters, the hot springs, when they were bubbling and boiling and, and agitated, then they would be healed. Uh, and, or at least get some relief. And so that's what that verb is used literally there. And in John 12, 7, it's used figuratively, figuratively of Christ's troubled soul as he anticipates uh, the coming uh, trial of, of uh, the crucifixion. So the term pictures the result of yielding to the, the assault of fear. So don't be agitated. Don't let fear overtake you, make you shake you. Don't let it shake you, I guess, is the idea. Now the pressure, the, the picture this puts is that, that there's pressure to silence the Christian message. And the natural reaction to pressure is fear or agitation. But our God is telling us, don't, let's not act this way. Let's not respond this way. So uh, I, want, I gave you the quotation from Isaiah 8, 11 through 13. Uh, I sort of, um, this is, uh, we're just pulling it out of context, so we're going to have to sort of try to rebuild the context. Part of this passage is where the famous, the most famous name in all the Bible is, is Meher Shalal Hashbaz. And I tease all those expectant mothers, including my daughter-in-law, that that is the, na the name they should be picking for the little boy who's coming. But uh, nobody has said they're going to do it yet. All right, so anyhow, I do love that name. And, uh, well, I do. It's so funny. It's a funny name. It means hurry, hurry, booty, booty. <laughs> it's talking about the, the armies that were threatening, uh, threatening uh, uh, Israel or Judah. And Isaiah is making a prophecy. No, they're, gonna, they're the ones that are going to be overtaken. They're going to be destroyed by the Assyrians, in fact, and they were. And, uh, and, and so you're going to name your son in honor of this defeat of your enemies and they're going to hurry get there there's lots of spoil that's what his name means all right Meher Shell al Hashbaz it's a great name anyhow anyhow so the context uh, and I guess we should I got some notes here and I'm not they're not very detailed so I, I, I want to give you the context and then I'll read this passage so the context and this is Isaiah 7 that's where the the prophets the uh, virgin will conceive, all right? And then Isaiah 9, which follows, uh, his name shall be called Wonderful and so forth. All right, so these are, the mess these are messianic prophecies that are all tied in with this. But the situation is that we have Judah, kingdom of the southern part of the Israelite kingdom. And on the north we have the king, uh, the Israel, a powerful kingdom, and most of them were not faithful to God. And the kings certainly weren't faithful to God. All right, and then there's north of Israel, there is a country called Aram, which is basically Syria, 
Uh, and the, you get the term, the language, Aramaic. It's the same root, same. This is the language of these people. Anyway, so both the king of Aram and the king of Israel were enemies of the king of Judah. And their plot was they were going to come down and defeat Judah, kill the king, put another king in his place so that he would, I don't know what, pay them taxes or something. I'm not sure what he was going to do. But anyway, this was the fear. This is what they were afraid of. And he was cast, the, the king of Judah was casting about for all kinds of solutions except going to the Lord. The Lord sent the prophet to him and said, don't worry. The Lord's going to take care of you. Trust the Lord. And so then there's these various prophecies, including the Meher Shalal Hashbaz prophecy. And there's another one earlier. There's two prophecies that begin uh, chapter 8. And then we come to this passage in Isaiah 8, verse 11. Now remember, uh, G Isaiah's preaching uh, calm, don't be afraid. Now he says, For thus says the, the Lord spoke to me with a mighty power instruct, and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people. Now the people of Judah are with the king and they are becoming afraid. All right? You are not to say, it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy. So they are mocking Isaiah's preaching, and that you're in, you're just trying to cause defeat for us, all right? And then he says, and you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. That's our quote. Okay, that's in 1 Peter. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy. Now, he, he paraphrases that. He doesn't quote it. It is the Lord of hosts you shall regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. All right, so this is, God is speaking to Isaiah, and, and the message is for Judah as well. Don't worry about these people. Be, you just follow the Lord. You make the Lord your God. You trust in him, and you keep on, he's basically saying to Isaiah, keep on preaching. Don't listen to these who want to shut you up. All right, so that's, that's the passage for Isaiah. So, if you, now here's my paraphrase of back in 1 Peter. If you should experience persecution, consider yourself blessed. Don't be afraid with their fear. Don't let their threats make you afraid. Don't let their fears infect your spirit. Don't let them cause you to stop speaking for God. All right? Because the, pro, the whole idea of persecution against Christianity is to get you to shut up, to stop talking for the Lord, stop evangelizing, stop mentioning his name, stop um, the, the ministry that you might have for him. They want you to stop, right? So he's saying, don't, don't be afraid. Just like Isaiah was to keep on preaching, you keep on preaching. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid with their fear. All right, so then let's look at verse 15, the positive thing. And that's also, as I said, this is a paraphrase. You notice in Isaiah 8, 13, it says, it is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy. Here it's put a little bit differently. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. All right? Now, so there's a parallel message here. Uh, in Isaiah, it is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy. So to make holy is to set apart, to see as unique, to, to exalt. And a quote here from Hebert says, The verb here does not mean to purify, to make holy, but to treat as holy. To set apart, to enshrine as the object of supreme absolute, supreme absolute reverence, as free from all defilement and possessed of all excellence. He must be set above all other allegiances. All right, and so... Uh, we're going to come back to this idea, but notice here it's saying, uh, in our version, it says, uh, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Now, there is, if you've got a King James in your lap, there's a slight difference here. The King James says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And that's because there's a variance in the text in the manuscripts. All right, so the reference to Christ occurs in older manuscripts, and some later manuscripts. It's one of those where there's a lot more, um, um, 
I guess the, the King James reading is a little less certain than, uh, in terms of the majority manuscripts than, uh, than many majority uh, readings are, if you follow what I'm saying. Uh, sometimes, when you have a variance, all of what is called the majority manuscripts will follow, or the King James follows, all of those majority manuscripts. And the variance only occurs in the older ones. In this case, that's not so. The variance is in some of the, what are called normally, the majority manuscripts. So, it's a little bit more ambiguous in some ways. It's a little harder to just vote for one. All right, it, the, the term using the word Christ here is a little bit more of an unusual uh, reading. Uh, now, the place, if Christ is the proper reading, and I think it is, I'll have to say, but if it is, if the place Christ occupies in this verse is in the place of Jehovah, the Lord, in Isaiah 8.13. Isaiah 8.13 said, let's just look at that again, it is the Lord of hosts, whom you should regard as holy. Now here Peter is saying, regard Christ as holy. Now, depending on which manuscripts are following. Now if it just says, regard the Lord God as holy, well it's saying exactly the same thing as Isaiah. And really, we know that it's the same thing anyway, because the Lord Jesus and Jehovah are one God. They're not two gods. All right? So we don't, we don't have two gods. And so in the end, it is... It is one of these, uh, it's a text that has a little ambigu ambiguity in the manuscripts, but the bottom line is, uh, the text is, I would say, is supportive of the deity of Christ, uh, especially if the term Christ is mentioned in it, but even if it isn't, it is the Lord, the message is the same, the Lord is the one who we're to set apart as holy, the one whom we're to fear, the one whom we're to regard as high. Okay, so, so here's the conclusion. The point for the believers is this. You are not to fear so as to be silent. You are to make the Lord holy so as to speak. Now, what, I mean, what do I mean by that? All right. If I am afraid of men and I become silent, who am I setting apart as holy? The men. But if I set apart the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord in heaven, as holy, and there are men who are trying to get me to stop speaking for him, who am I setting apart as holy? The Lord. And I'm going to keep on speaking. You see, so don't fear. Here's the message. Don't fear. Set apart the Lord. Make the Lord. How important is the Lord to you? All right, so that's the message here that he's getting at. Now, this is further amplified in this verse. It doesn't just stop with that first phrase. And this is a little bit of grammar here, so a little complications. But if you look at it here, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. And it's a little hard to translate this next bit exactly because there's no verb here. What we have is a, we have an adjective. And it's just a phrase. All right? And we have it supplied here in the New American, it says, always being ready to make a defense. And so being is added as a verb to try to help us. Uh, what's added in the King James? Does anybody? It says, be ready, sorry, be ready always. To okay, so, okay, so it's adding the same verb. It's adding be. But the be isn't there. It's just they're trying to help us make sense out of this. All right, so here, let me just give you a little bit of grammar so you can see where I'm going with this. Okay, the verb... Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts is a plural verb. Now, you didn't know verbs could be plural, but it, it can be. Well, the, it requires a plural subject. You all, okay, with an, with an imperative verb, you have an understood subject, you, but this is plural, second person. Uh, second person plural. So it, it understands you all, all right, you all. It's, southern, it's a southern verb. Okay, okay, all right, so then we come to this adjective, always, uh, always, be, uh, always ready, always ready is the adjective. It is plural, all right, it agrees with the you all that is understood in the verb. Does that make sense? Okay, so far you're with me, all right. 
That's the end of the grammar lesson. So that ties this description. What he's saying is, this is the ones who are supposed to be setting apart the Lord are those who are ready to give an answer, to give a, an apology, all right? Apologia, all right? A, a defense. Those are the ones who are to be sanctifying the Lord in their hearts, the ones who are ready to give this defense. So, uh, what does that mean? That means you've, you've set the Lord apart in your heart and you have a message to speak. You have a word to speak. You're ready. It's you, all of you, all of us, really. When we turn it around to ourselves. So just as Isaiah was to keep speaking in Judah, so we are to keep speaking in the world. And there's only one modification to this. He says, but, or yet, with gentleness and reverence. So in other words, we're not to, you know, we're not to be in their face about the gospel. All right, you, you better understand who you're dealing with here. Right. Okay. Uh, we're, we're to, we're to speak, keep speaking the message with gentleness and reverence. Just, you know, well, you know, a simple testimony. You don't have to be eloquent. Just quiet. And keep on talking for the Lord. That's the idea. Our speech is without fear, but also without pride or defiance. Oh, I put in here the same qualities taught to us in the submission section. So that whole section we've been going through for the last several months, where we're to be people who are, you know, this is, con this is contrary to our nature, but we're to be people who have submissive spirits, who are trying to walk with the Lord, trying to be gentle to one, uh, to one another in our own relationships and with our authority relationships to have a humble, uh, sincere spirit. That's how we're to be. And even here, as we face persecution and there are people who would attack us, if that should ever happen, here's what we don't, we don't, that fear, we're to not let it to intimidate us, but we're also, we're also to set the Lord apart in our hearts because we have something to say in his defense. Okay, so that's what this next, that whole the verse is talking about, trying to put it in simple language. I hope I didn't confuse you. Uh, made sense to me when I wrote it down. All right. Now verse 16. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ shall be put, will be put to shame. So look, look back to Isaiah here. I just picked two, those two ver first two verses. Thus says the Lord, the Lord spoke to me with mighty power and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, you are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy, and you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. So the line is a conspiracy seems to be the line of the people. And in a sense, they're criticizing Isaiah, I think. Yet Isaiah spoke the word of the Lord truly. No conspiracy in his words. His conscience is clear. All right? And so the way we can stand without fear when under pressure as Christians is by living in such a way to make them lie about you to persecute you. All right? It's no, there's no sense in being a, a sneak and a liar and a cheater and an untrustworthy person. And when they come after you and they call you all those names and it's true, you have no defense. You can't stand up and make the Lord holy. You can't set him apart. You can't speak for him. And so uh, you need to be live in such a way that they can't tell lies, or that the only way they can get at you is to tell lies about you. So in this way, your persecutors will bear the shame, not you. I remember a preacher talking about attacks that he had been under. Now, he was a pretty strong preacher, and he was very well known in his area, and uh, it caused, there was a lot of conflict, and a lot, he got involved in politics too, so there's a lot of controversy. And he told a story one time about how he had been accused of all kinds of things. And in fact, he had been accused of being a wife beater. He says, the funny thing is, he says, at that time, I didn't even have a wife. <laughs> so that's what I mean. 
It's the kind of thing where you live for the Lord, you keep your testimony pure, you keep your, uh, your uh, words uh, gentle, you don't, you know, you don't, they're after you, you don't lose your temper. This is very hard for me. You don't lose your temper. You just keep speaking the Lord's word and, uh, and they have nothing. They can't attach you with anything. They can't attack you with anything. You just speak the word. You tell the truth. And there is nothing they can say. They are the ones who are bearing the shame. And so the conclusion, verse 17, is my conclusion. It says, For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. Now, if God should will it so, remember I talked to you last time about the optative mood? This is the same one. It's this very rare construction, and it shows up in this verse also. If God should will it, it's not that he's going to, it's not that it's a probability, it's something that could happen, but it's not necessarily going to happen. All right, The verb of potential, not probability. Now, uh, another commentator says, Peter still does not want his readers to be occupied occupied with an expectation of persecution. Well, that is certainly a possibility. And in 4.12, Peter is much more direct. It is only such if God wills. And when one knows that his suffering is willed by God, he can endure it patiently. But when one knows his suffering is undeserved as well, he can endure it as a blessed service to Christ our Lord. You know, if, if you are to suffer for something that you deserve to suffer for, well, in a way you can bear it because you think, well, I deserve that. But here's the blessing of suffering for something you don't deserve. You're suffering it for the Lord. You're suffering it according to his will. And that makes it something more noble than just suffering for your own misdeeds, doesn't it? Paul says, I'm, I, I glory in the cross, and uh, I bear in my body the marks of his crucifixion. And if the Lord wills it so, then may we stand and be this kind of person, just as Peter and Paul exhort us. Now, I have a couple other words from the commentaries. They don't, didn't really fit into my notes, but I thought I wanted you to, to share them with you, so I stuck them at the end here. Okay, the, the first one, the suffering of God's people for well-doing is not God's usual, but his unusual will for them. As living under his grace, his will is involved in whatever happens to us. If he permit, permits suffering, it is for our good. As Luther remarked, go on in faith and love. If the cross comes, take it. If it comes not, do not seek it. All right, so I thought that was pretty good advice. He's talking, we're talking in this passage about persecution as a possibility. If it does come, Luther's advice, take it. If it doesn't come, don't go out there trying to find it. You know, like, you know, you know don't be an idiot, basically, is the other, his, his point there. All right? And then this last one is, comes from Spurgeon. He says, yet we hear a person say, I would not mind being blamed if I deserved it, which is very absurd since it is the deserving of blame which ought to trouble us far more than the rebuke. All right, so I thought that was, you know, I was thinking there earlier, yeah, well, you know, if I deserved it, I could take it. Well, the thing is, you should be ashamed of deserving it. <laughs> all right, and that, that's true too. And anyway, so just all these comments. Well, the Lord has given us an interesting lesson here, and I pray that it'll uh, be a blessing to your heart as you think about the kind of life you want to lead. It's not that we are out looking for persecution. We're just aware. It's something in the back of our minds. It's a possibility, but how should we live? And how should we prepare ourselves for that life if such a thing should happen? We see the things happening in Ukraine. I'm sure those Christians there were not expecting this year to open and they would have to be running for their lives or cowering in fear in basements or whatever it might be. But do pray for them and, uh, and let's prepare ourselves for the remote possibility that any such thing should come to us someday. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this passage, and we pray that it might uh, stir our hearts to follow you. Lord, I pray for your blessing in all that we're doing. 
uh, here in our church. Help us each one to keep following you. We pray for your, all of these requests we had on our list today. We just pray you'll bless in each of those situations and you'll bless as we go home tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm.